Dr. Marianne J. Legato. I'm a professor of clinical medicine at Columbia University. In spite of their obvious increased physical strength compared to women, men are more vulnerable biologically than women are. The vulnerability begins in the womb. Far fewer male embryos make it to delivery compared with females. Even at birth, boys are developmentally behind their sisters and are prey to developmental disabilities and respiratory problems, among others, in the immediate weeks, uh, in the weeks immediately after birth. This vulnerability continues during the course of their life. One of the most important health problems of men is the early onset of coronary artery disease, which begins to be symptomatic in many men in the mid-30s. And those men who have coronary disease are usually dead before the age of 65. I think this is one of the most compelling health problems that men face and something on which we should really be concentrating. Developmental disabilities are four to six times more frequent in males than in females. We don't really know why this is correct. But a very interesting theory has developed in which it was pointed out by some neonatal experts that the brains of boys are larger than those of their sisters, and at the same time their metabolic rate is lower, so that the demands of the bigger brain are really not met as efficiently by the low metabolic rate, which doesn't d deliver enough oxygen and blood to the brain, as is the case with their sisters who have smaller and probably more efficient systems of providing the brain with blood and oxygen. One of the most vulnerable periods for men or males is during adolescence. There is a lag time in the development of the systems in the brain that have to do with risk assessment and judgment. At the same time, the surge of testosterone makes them prone to idealistic, impulsive, and risk-taking behavior so that suicide and violent death is far more common in the male adolescent than it is in the female adolescent. We really capitalize on this, sadly, by sending 18-year-olds to war. Uh, a very smart man said to me, who was in the military, that if you ask an 18-year-old to take a well-defended object, objective, he'll say, when. If you ask a 30-year-old to take the same objective, he'll say, how? And if you ask a 40-year-old man, he'll say, why? I think there are definite steps we should be taking and taking immediately to ensure better and longer lives for men. In the first place, we should stop regarding them as the, quote, stronger, unquote, sex. They're biologically much less hardy in many ways than our women. In particular, we should be concentrating, in my opinion, on the early onset of coronary disease, which takes such a terrible toll of men. And I think the American Heart Association should have a program called Go Blue for Men, the way it does Go Red for Women. I think heart disease and its early and devastating onset in men is one of the most important health problems that we face. The Y chromosome is definitely unique among all the chromosomes. Over most of its extent, it can't exchange with its partner, the X chromosome, to repair its uh, deficiencies or mutations in DNA. It's learned to repair itself in an interesting and unique way. The issues with the Y chromosome are that they're exposed to environmental toxins because they're housed outside the body in the scrotal sac. Many millions are produced every day, and therefore mutations are far more frequent in the Y chromosome than in, in the uh, X or indeed in any uh, of the other chromosomes. So the male drives evolutionary development because of this extraordinary proliferation of mutations that are characteristic of sperm and the Y chromosome. The generally accepted statistic is that women are twice as likely to suffer from depression as men. I don't think this is correct. I think that the signs and symptoms of depression in men 
are very different than those in women. In spite of great sadness and pessimism, men tend not to communicate their distress. They go it alone, as they do in so many areas of their lives. And they turn to self-medication, sometimes with excessive TV, excessive sexual activity, or excessive drinking as symptoms of their distress. There's no question, question that depression can be fatal in both sexes, including, obviously, in men. People lose their appetite, they can't sleep, they don't take action against threats in the environment, and I think that there is no question that depression, which, by the way, also depresses the action of the immune system and makes people prone to infection, um, is a very serious warning that a fatal outcome is a possibility. So depression should never be underestimated. A very interesting thing about depression was commented on, in fact, by my father, who was a physician years ago, when he said that the time to be most on guard against suicide is in the partially treated depressed patient. He pointed out that when they're profoundly depressed, they can't take action even to end their own lives. But as they improve, they begin to see ways to carry out uh, their very sad objective. And I think that that's reflected in many of the warnings that some of our antidepressants, when we start to give them, result in the suicide of patients unexpectedly. And I think it may be due to this general principle that the depressed patient in treatment has to be very carefully watched because there's this time of special vulnerability. Well.